in the worship guide, there's email addresses and such um, for us to communicate. Please turn to 2 Thessalonians. We're in our series where we're doing an overview of one of Paul's letters every week. Letters from the ambassador. The first part of the year, we studied the life of Paul. And then to follow up with that, we're studying the missionary letters. So when David read a missionary letter to us moments ago, he was sort of reenacting what, we're gonna, what had been done in Paul's day, where he was writing letters and instructing that the letters be read to the churches. Now over the years, there's been an element of Christianity that has sought opportunity to alert us to the specific time that the Lord Jesus would return. Now, I don't mean the cartoon guy with the sandwich board or the sign that says, the end is near. Um, I mean, there's people that have set very specific dates. I remember years ago, um, 1988, I got in the mail, and, and I won't forget it just because it was such a snappy title. 88 reasons why Jesus was going to return in 1988. And I was like, 88 reasons? That's amazing. So I read through all those different reasons. I don't remember any of them. And, of course, it didn't matter. Well, it was 10 years ago or so, Terry and I got to take the uh, K-Love cruise, the music and all of that, and we left from Fort Lauderdale, uh, Miami. We left from Miami. We spent the night in Fort Lauderdale. And I remember driving to the airport, and there were billboards up warning us of the end of the world on May 21st I found a copy online of one of those billboards and they were all over town in Miami as we were driving uh, to the port and so I was of course glad that we had scheduled our cruise before the Lord returned and you've probably had things like man I hope I get back when I was in college you know it was like I hope I get married before the Lord returns and then there were other I hope the kids have come along you've probably had things like that and so I'm glad to pass on to you that the Cruise got finished, and the guy that came up with that May 21st date, clearly he blew the deal. So what he did is he started saying, save the date, October 21st, 2011. And the man has been wrong 12 times. You would give up, wouldn't? How many of you would give up if you were wrong uh, 12 times? And you know, it's not just Christians that are doing that. Our entire culture was mobilized for something. See if you can pull that next picture up. Our entire... The end of the world is coming as soon as the computers all turn over to 12 o'clock midnight on uh, December 31st or January 1st, 2000. Y2K. And some of you still probably have bottled water in your basement from leading up to that uh, day. Um, it was a, not too many years ago that the whole culture was abuzz because the Mayan calendar was going to run out. And that was in December of 2012. And hey, the Mayan calendar runs out of time, so surely that must mean the end of things. And it wasn't even in our lifetime. In 1910, Halley's Comet was making one of those 76-year laps around. And all over the country... And all over the world, people were all in a panic because Halley's Comet was around and the end of the world was in sight. And it wasn't even in that century because in 1841, a guy named William Miller predicted the end of the world. And he said it's going to happen by 1843. And uh, that didn't happen then. And uh, then he predicted it for a later date. He kept pushing it out further. And it even goes back further than that. I often say that the Bible could have been written yesterday because of its relevance. And do you know that two decades after Jesus ascended to heaven, Paul had to write 2, Corinthians, 2 Thessalonians to say, the Lord has not returned yet. Settle down. Get busy serving the Lord. It hasn't happened. And that's the premise of 2 Thessalonians is the... End is near, and everybody was in a panic, and people in, in Thessalonica were quitting their jobs, and they were like going up on top of the hill with their luggage. You can picture this, kind of it's like a movie scene, and waiting for the Lord to come back. And they had literally quit their jobs. When we get to chapter 3, there's instruction like, get back to work. Serve and 
mind your own business at work, get to work. The end of the Lord hasn't come. There's going to be signs to look for that we're going to talk about. Just fascinating. I just want to say, stop what you're doing and read the Bible. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus was giving uh, end of times prophecy. And then he said this. It's in Mark 13, verse 32. He said this. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Now, let me find the guy that predict, made 12 predictions and he's been wrong every time. Evidently, he didn't see this verse. Because it says no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the... What's the next line? That tells us Jesus didn't even know the time. But somehow that guy uh, knew all 12 dates. The eight, whoever wrote the 88 reasons. So he said, only the Father knows. Take heed. Watch and pray because you don't know when the time is. Pay attention, live a holy life, be working for God because we don't know when it is. The disciples still didn't get it. It's in human nature to want to predict the end times. So uh, after Mark 13, some weeks go by, Jesus has resurrected from the grave and he's ready to ascend to heaven. In Acts chapter 1, he gathers his close followers around him. And in verse 6, uh, the disciples, this is what they say to Jesus. They come all together and they said, Lord, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this when you set your authority up? Is this when the world ends for all the bad guys and you show yourself the boss? And the next verse, Jesus answers them. And he's like, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father's put in his own authority. Nobody knows. Just stop, I want to say to those people. Live a holy life. Get back to work, he tells them. So we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians and try to unpack this a little bit. The Christians in Thessalonica, life was hard. They were being persecuted for their faith. When we studied last week 1 Thessalonians and then we went back into Acts chapter 17, which we looked at in the spring, uh, Paul got run out of town for preaching Christ. They had themselves a little riot that took place there. And the persecution continued. 1 Thessalonians hinted at it and 2 Thessalonians tells us that the persecution of the Christians ramped up. It was even worse. It was getting worse. And so the people were like, Maybe the end has happened. Look how bad it is. This looks like the great tribulation going on here. So verse, chapter 1, verse 1. Let's read a couple verses here in the book. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonican, Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from our God and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because... Your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So we're going to divide the book up into three parts easily each chapter. The first part talks to us about there's how to have hope during persecution. Then the second part about the uh, day of the Lord, that judgment day, and then the third chapter, uh, a challenge to the idol to get back to work. So the first few verses we just read, he's thankful for their faith, their love, and their endurance. Last week in 1 Thessalonians, he totally affirmed them in their faith, their hope, and their love, and he continues that theme with their faith, you guys are continuing to grow in faith. You're continuing to grow in love. You're enduring hard times. You've got it in you. And uh, keep that going. But then he begins to say that your suffering means that you're participating in God's kingdom. Starting in verse 4, this, the many persecutions and tribulations that you're enduring. You're experiencing God's kingdom at work. When you're living, suffering. How many people teach in our culture that 
if they just were living right with God, they would be healthy and wealthy and everything would just work out and they're having problems because they don't have enough faith. Paul tells these people here, your faith is exploding, your faith is growing, and you're having a lot of troubles. Now that's not going to sell a lot of books at the bookstore. That's not going to get a lot of listeners to the podcast. But that's reality of life. Note all the different references to suffering. Verse 4, we read it. Look at verse 5. They are enduring, and it's, it's manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you are counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. I have that suffering there. Verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Verse 7. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So he says, when you're suffering, what you're going through, you're joining with God. I mean, we're following a Savior who was arrested, put on trial, and crucified. Jesus said, they persecuted me. Why would you think it would be any different for you? So there's a necessity here that's communicated to us. And that's the necessity of spiritual grit. Spiritual grit. Tenacity. Perseverance. Endurance. How easily somebody gets their feelings hurt and they pull away from church. Well, somebody said this and somebody said that and somebody didn't pat me on the back enough times and somebody didn't do that. And that's all it takes sometimes for somebody to back away. Like, where's the grit? Where's the stamina? Where's the spiritual guts? And he's saying, it's going to take that. Parents so often can rescue their kids when life gets a little hard. And far better to let them experience some hardship. Pedal their bikes uphill. He goes on in this text to tell us that suffering builds character the end of verse 5, he says that you would be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. That your character would grow. That your faith would deepen because of the hard times that you're going through. And in this text, he gives some comments about God's righteousness. God's righteousness and God's judgment. It's called righteous. The judgment of God is called righteous. Now, how many people have thought about God and they say... Well, my God's a God of love. I couldn't possibly, you know, a God of judgment. I couldn't go for that. My God's a God of love and uh, compassion. He's not a, a God of judgment and justice. That's very, it just sounds wrong, doesn't it? So let's say, for example, let's pick a worst case scenario. Let's say that your, your, your mother is murdered. We're picking a worst case. Your mother is murdered and the person is arrested and they stand before the judge. And the judge says to them, you know, I'm a judge of compassion and love. You're free to go. Now, how many think that that judge is a compassionate judge? That judge just let somebody off the hook. Where's the justice for the one that was wronged? Where's the justice for the one that was offended? That's not justice. God in his justice is righteous. It says it in verse 5. I've got it circled there. It says it in verse 6. I have it marked there. Another thing about the justice of God is that it's anticipated. As we're reading through here, it's like we can't wait for this to happen. God says that he will repay with tribulation those who trouble you in verse 6. And Verse 7, we're going to give rest to those who are troubled. It's anticipated. Man, we can't wait till it happens. We're longing for the day. And some of you have gone through hard times and you've said, God, how long is it going to be before justice happens? Revelation chapter 6, in that great tribulation, there, uh, verse 10 and 11, there's these words. They cried with a loud voice and they said, How long, O Lord, and 
until you judge and avenge our blood on the earth. These were the saints that had been martyred. How long until you judge our saints? Look at verse 11. Then a right robe was given to each of them, and it was said of them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who had been killed were completed. God's waiting until there's a day. But when that day comes, there will be justice. And so many times people demand justice now. We've got to have justice now. And what that says is, I'm not trusting the God who that describes himself as a righteous judge. I'm not trusting his timing. I'm not trusting him to be sufficient. That's what makes forgiveness so significant is that we're saying, I'm leaving the judgment to God. I release them to God for his judgment. It's described at the end of verse 7 and into verse 8 that when this judgment comes, it's revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. It goes on and it's described for us. It sounds very similar to Revelation chapter 19. I'll just give you the verses for the sake of time. Verses 11 through 16. But it uses the same imagery in the book of Revelation to describe the return of the Lord. The Bible titles that time. It's titled the day of the Lord. The time of God's final justice on evil. We look out at the world and we say, how does God let this happen? How could God keep this going? When is God going to put a stop to it? There will come a time, God's final justice. The Old Testament prophets all talk about the day of the Lord. Amos and Joel, Zephaniah, Isaiah, Zechariah, all talk about the day of the Lord. Revelation describes it. And here in this uh, chapter and as we get into chapter 2, it speaks even more about it. And so there's some results given. Verse 9. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. I was fascinated by that phrase, from the presence of the Lord. Hell's an awful place and it's a literal place. But Paul here says the worst part about it is you're not anywhere near the presence of God. What a fascinating description. Now what he does is give people, a lot of times people are like, well, how can a loving God send people to hell? And what this text tells us is God's giving people what they've wanted all their lives. They've lived their lives without God. They've lived their lives avoiding God. And so God's going to give them what they've lived for. Absence, the presence of God. And then verse 10 tells us, about in that day, they will, saints, the believers, will be glorified and be admired among all those who believe. We're going to marvel at the splendor of who God is. Let me spend a couple minutes in our remaining time in chapter 2. It's an expansion of this day of the Lord thought. And in chapter 2, what was happening is people were actually using Paul's name to say, The day of the Lord has already happened. You've missed it. You've been left behind. And that's what Paul says. And so Paul even has to address it in verse 2. He says, as though it were from us that these instructions have come. And that's not the case. Verse 5, I want to go there. Do Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. What restraining force against evil exists in the world today? That's the Holy Spirit and believers and the church. So he gives us a couple of signs. He says, don't let yourself be troubled or deceived by things that are going on around us. But then he gives us three things that need to happen before the day of the Lord. So it doesn't surprise us. He's telling us it's obvious here. One is there's going to be a full-on spiritual rebellion. A spiritual rebellion. In verse 3, it says there will be a falling away. 
Now we look out at our world and we say, I don't know how it can get any worse. This looks like a full-on spiritual rebellion to me. The scripture tells us it's going to get worse. The rebellion against God will get worse. Um, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm sorry, verse 1, it says, Know this also, that in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And we won't read the rest. It goes down through many verses describing the culture, honestly, that we live in. But it tells us in 2 Thessalonians that there's a restraining force for good that exists in the world. And one day that restraining force will be removed. When that restraining force is removed, the Antichrist, the lawless one, will be revealed. It says that in verse 3 and 4. The man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition. The lawless one. He opposes God and he exalts himself above every God. He's going to sit in the temple as if he were God. He's going to use signs and wonders, it says here in verse 9. This lawless one will come according to the working of Satan. Satan will empower him. Very much like uh, when Moses went to the Pharaoh in Egypt and Pharaoh's magicians reenacted some of the uh, things that Moses was demonstrating the power of God. And then someday, and when that happens, the restrainer will be removed. The church is raptured to heaven. The Holy Spirit is removed. And the, the dam that has been holding sin back. I mean, we're, what we're witnessing is an overflow of sin. Imagine the day when there is unrestrained evil. Imagine the day. Look, just look at the lies that are propagated today from the evolutionary philosophy that just tells people that they're animals and survival of the fittest and then people are acting that out. Islam continues to kill Christians in Africa and Asia at an alarming rate. Do you know that this year in one country, Nigeria, there's been over 3,000 Christians killed. That's an average of 17 Christians a day getting killed in Nigeria. In the last, um, let me see how far, 12 years. In the last 12 years, the time we've been in our building here. In Nigeria alone, 17,000 churches have been attacked by the Muslims there. And they have killed 43,000 Christians in 12 years. Another 18,000 have been permanently disappeared. What's going to happen the day when there's unrestrained evil? Eight or so years ago, a movie came out that I wouldn't recommend and I've never seen, but I watched the trailer again this week because of the premise of the movie. The movie was called The Purge, and it said there that for one night a month, one night a year, no law applies, and you can do anything you want to anybody that one night. Now, that's a freaky movie that I have no interest in watching, but what's when the restrainer is moved and any, there is no law, there is no rule of law, there's no Holy Spirit, there's no believers. If we think it's crazy in our world, imagine if, it was, if there were no Christians at the place you work. Imagine if there were no Christians in the legislature of Kansas or the U.S. or whatever. Imagine if there were no Christians in our world. Imagine if there were no Christians in county government and state. Imagine. Not This restrainer passage is frightening. And somehow he comes to verse 13. And he says, we're bound to give thanks. How can we give thanks after all of that? We're bound to give thanks to God. Brethren, beloved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in His truth, to which He called you by our gospel. And what he's saying is, we can give thanks because God knows those who are his. And the followers of Christ can find rest 
and peace. We don't have to live in a panic at the craziness that's going on. We have a restrainer living within us. We don't need to live in panic where you work or in the family or when you look out at the world. God's got a plan and he has a purpose. We don't need to quit our jobs, pack our suitcases, go sit up on the top of the mountain and wait for the Lord to come back and sing, I don't know, whatever kumbaya song we're going to sing. We don't have to do all of that because the day of the Lord, he's working a plan. And so chapter 3 gets, get back to work and live your life and follow God. Live in sanctification and holiness because someday the Lord is going to come back. But when the restrainer is moved, that's when it's going to get crazy. But how thankful are we that we're in the church that gets removed with the restrainer. And then the lawless one will be judged. And Revelation describes that thoroughly. And so he ends the book. Look at verse 16 of chapter 3. He says there, May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. How is that possible when life is so crazy? How is that possible when evil is just going crazy in our world? Because our peace isn't dependent on the world. Our peace is dependent on the God of peace. That's where we find, not in circumstances, not in how everybody else is behaving, but in who God is. And so may the God of peace give you peace. And that's where our hope is. And so we would summarize it this way, the way the Bible Project ended their video on 2 Thessalonians. What you hope for shapes what you live for. What you hope for, if you're hoping for all the circumstances to work out and all the people in your life to just settle down and play along with what you got planned, then that's how you're going to live. Swayed and tossed and anxious and manipulative. But if your hope is in Jesus Christ, and his plan, and his timing, and his righteous judgment that will come in his time, then we can live at peace, and we can live a holy life. Let's stand together, please. Let's bow for prayer. God in heaven, I... I pray that we find our hope in you and that we then live in that direction. When we look around at the world, we see craziness. And when, if we were to put our hope there, there would be nothing but trouble and anxiety and fear and worry. But I pray this body of people live in a restraining kind of way in our work environments, in our family environments. Thank you that as believers we don't live through that purge, that unrestrained evil. You have saved us from the wrath to come. Thank you that we can trust you in your justice and trust you in your peace. We can trust you in your plan and your timing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, one of our core values is discipleship.